We all know the drill. Arrive at the desk, tag your bag, print your boarding pass, and head through security. Finally, you make it through. Get the obligatory super-sized chocolate bar in Duty Free, and then time to find the gate. Board the plane, and get ready for takeoff. That's all there is to it. It's all very familiar. But behind the scenes, there's a hidden world of complexity. Take your suitcase. Once you've checked in, your baggage sets out on its own long and secret journey before eventually joining you on board. Here in Dubai, they handle enormous volumes of luggage. In just three hours during the morning rush, they process around 50,000 bags. Stacked like this, they'd reach as high as Dubai's Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Annually, the airport handles a staggering 57 million items. That's equivalent to 1,100 Burj Khalifas. And it's all got to be whisked through the airport. Every bag must get to the right plane at exactly the right time. To make sure that happens, each individual bag needs one of these. The humble bag tag. So on your baggage tag, which we've all seen obviously, you've got things like your name, and then here we've got the DXB, which is a three-digit code for the airport that you're heading to. But the really important thing is this mysterious 10-digit number along the bottom. This is like your bag's passport number, if you like. So the digits identify the airline, your particular bag's ID number, and then there's a special message digit which identifies the priority of the bag or any other information they need to know, high priority, low priority, that kind of thing. This code is part of the universal language of aviation, an international system that knows no borders. And it determines exactly what will happen to your suitcase after check-in. 25 meters beneath the airport lies a bizarre subterranean world. A sprawling 85-mile high-speed railway network, costing around 500 million pounds to build, this is the world's biggest luggage system. This place is absolutely enormous. Everywhere you go, there are just miles and miles of these conveyor belts, of these trays that carry the suitcases moving along. It's really weird. It's like some kind of post-apocalyptic fairground ride. But the strange thing is, you don't see any human beings. It's completely automated. It's like the robots have taken over. After check-in, your bag is spat onto a yellow tray. Each tray has been chipped with a unique ID, and a computer tracks which bag has landed in which tray. So each tray is specific for each bag? It is, yeah. Okay, so, so instead of tracking that bag, we track you the track tray. You track the tray instead, I and see. And that tray has an ID, which will allow us to track it 100%. The human being tasked with keeping an eye over this vast system is baggage manager Graham Pollock. What we have around various points in the baggage system are what you see here is some read stations. This, this, this thing here? This thing here. This sensor will pick up the information from the tray. So the tray knows where it's going. It will tell this part of the baggage system, and here I am, please send me to this location. And then the baggage system will then divert it to the necessary output point. The computerized brain of the luggage system plots every inch of your bag's journey to the aircraft. 
If your flight's leaving within an hour, the computer sends your baggage straight to the loading area. But for those of us with better timekeeping, our bags end up here, the early baggage storage system. If you've checked in a little bit too early, what happens is the bags will wait here, and then as soon as it's time for them to, to make the journey to the aircraft, a little red robot shuttle will whiz along here, pick up the tray and put it on the, the conveyor belt system, and then away it goes. Look, there goes a robot. The sheer volume of baggage moving through here is breathtaking. It simply can't be allowed to fail, so it's monitored constantly from the control room. There are more people working here than on the entire length of the conveyor system. Copy the 886 and 374, you need to clear it fast, please. If it's taking time, let me know, please. Can you just explain a little bit about how this works? Because it looks like a full-on something you might find in a railway network. It looks incredibly complicated. Basically, you can see the right now red, yellow and green. Uh, green shows the system is normal, basically, the green colour. So, red shows a fault. And there's also yellow as well. Yeah. So what is yellow, yellow? Yellow is basically a queuing where the bags wait. So it's basically like a traffic light. Green, good, yes, yellow. Yes, Brr, yes, might yes, have a problem. Red yes. is like, ah! So right now we're doing the runway inspection. We're looking at any type of debris, uh, metal, any types of bolts, screws, even plastic. John Ryan is responsible for foreign object debris collection. I'm helping him scour every inch of Atlantis tarmac. This runway safety inspection involves looking for any pieces of debris that might have fallen onto the ground from a plane or airport vehicle. Sounds straightforward enough, but there's just a 45 second window between landings to check an entire runway. And we're being chased by a 65 ton passenger plane. When you're taking that long way, I think, at some speed, and only just got off in time for another plane to come into land. And this is the quiet period. This is the quiet period, yeah. John's looking out for even the tiniest objects that might have been left behind. A screw. Oh, really? Gee, it's a nut. Not. So that's Together. probably off a of bag cart. Oh, okay. It's uh, quite warped, isn't it? Yeah. Is that dangerous? Yeah, that's definitely a, a dangerous idea. Yeah. So you're driving along at 30 miles an hour? Correct. And that's, it, that's enough to spot things like tiny bits of metal? Correct. Yeah. You've got skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of metal on the runway, how much of an of a impact could that have? It could have a catastrophic effect. Even fragments as small as this have the potential to wreak havoc. They could puncture a tyre or be flicked up and turned into a projectile, damaging an aircraft's fuselage. Sucked into an engine, a fragment could hit fan blades spinning at 10,000 revolutions a minute, causing serious damage. As a passenger, when you're coming into land, it just doesn't occur to you that there's a team of people like you looking out for things as small as this Correct. that could have that dramatic an impact I as know. to have a catastrophic failure for the, for the plane. Yep, it's not just that airplane or a piece of metal, it's hundreds of lives that are at stake. So we, you know, we are at you know, the highest level of perception uh, for any type of debris out there. This is the village of Gimont in southwest France. Nothing much happens here most of the time. But once every two weeks, in the dead of night, all that changes. Here it comes. 
just coming through the mist. Such a weird sight seeing this enormous thing emerging out of the mist. This huge section of wing coming past and dwarfing the little French houses next to it. It's absolutely insane. These are the gargantuan building blocks of just one A380. Seeing them drive these massive sections of plane through this tiny medieval French village does really beg the question, why would you go to this much effort? Why would you drive these things down such a narrow country lane? The answer lies with its multi-billion pound price tag. The A380 cost over 16 billion pounds to design and build, so no one country could carry that risk. Instead, four nations invested, France, Germany, Britain and Spain. In return for their money, they each got the right to manufacture part of the enormous plane. This nocturnal procession is the result. The wings travel over 900 miles from North Wales. The fuselage made in Hamburg covers a similar distance. And the giant tail section over 1,200 miles from southern Spain. This is effectively a kit of parts that all come together here in France. And this convoy is the last leg of an epic European relay. It's the job of the controllers here to keep track of the vast number of planes and make sure they never collide by fine-tuning their routes. Sean Sanders has ultimate responsibility for making sure this vital system works without a hitch. So, Sean, tell me what we're looking at here. So, what you're looking at right now is every single aircraft that we're tracking via radar over the United States and up here is the Canada. So these are all of the planes across America all right in, now? Right now, as we speak. What you're looking at is over 5,500 planes right now. Wow. This looks like a swarm of bees. How do you even go about organizing this chaos? Looking at it like this, it looks like a lot, and it is a lot, but it's extremely organized. And we have invisible highways in the skies, and these planes fly those highways to get from point A to point B. And each segment along the way, they make their left turn or right turn or go straight until they get to their destination. But is it almost as though you're looking at all of the cars in a city moving around, but you just can't see the roads? Correct. Ordinarily, it's busy enough, but over Thanksgiving, the controllers handle up to 9,000 flights in a day. That's on average one every 10 seconds. Preventing aviation gridlock takes total focus and concentration. Next Wednesday uh, is the busiest travel day of the year. The day before Thanksgiving here in the United States. Are you really on edge on that day? No. <laughs> do you have anxiety dreams about this man? Never. This is just what we do. We don't think about the number of people on the planes or how many planes. We know we have hundreds of thousands of people's lives in our hand, but that's not what's running through your mind when you're controlling these planes. Since 1991, the volume of passengers at British airports has more than doubled. But there are still a huge number of potential passengers who have never flown for one very good reason, fear. Around 15% of the UK population is afraid of flying. Many of them so anxious that it stops them from ever boarding a plane. Humans are only really built to be a land-based animal. And so a fear of flying is just a natural reaction to being at such extreme heights. And in some ways, the more extraordinary thing is that any of us have managed to train our minds to be comfortable up there at 35,000 feet. But as we become much more of an airborne species, not getting over it 
really is no longer an option. Globally, fear of flying, or aviophobia, deprives the airlines of millions of potential passengers. So no surprise they're interested in helping us get over it. I've come to the two-day fearless flight course, which, if all goes to plan, will culminate with these phobics taking a flight. And to help me understand aviophobia a little better, I'll be following one of them, Gordon Smith, over the next two days. When was the last time you got on a plane then? Probably about 10 years ago. So what is it in particular that, you, that worries you when you're in the air? I think it's the lack of control. You know, if something happens, then there's nothing I can do about that. Just a feeling of impending doom. You know, just absolute trepidation. All my family went on holiday together last year. I had to miss out on that, so I thought I better do something about it. I haven't even told my wife that I'm here. Oh, really? No, she no doesn't know? No clue that I'm here. So that if I don't go through with it, you know, she, can, she won't be booking a holiday tomorrow night or anything. So for the session this afternoon and for the flight tomorrow, both Gordon and I were going to be wearing these heart rate monitors. Now, how quickly your heart beats can be used as a measure of your anxiety levels. And the idea is that we're going to try to get to the bottom of what is causing Gordon's fear of flying. Please welcome to the stage Captain Pete West. If you're a bit anxious, even the sound of a soft chime may be alarming or even several in rapid succession. To help the phobics overcome their fear, a pilot first explains those mysterious in-flight noises. I think this next sound sounds rather like a dog barking underneath the floor. Has anybody heard that and thought, carrying a dog at the cargo hold, or even a man with a saw? Who wants to ask their first question? Who's got the first question here? What safety do you have in place if the wheels fail to drop? What other bad weather can affect flying, like wind and rain? What ends in harm to the pilots? In my mind, um, a Canada goose has just flown into the left engine. Yeah. It's all burst into flames. Just hearing people talk about flying has almost doubled Gordon's normal heart rate. Next, the phobics are taught psychological coping techniques to try to control their fight or flight response. Breathe in and push out. Which should help them handle tomorrow's exposure therapy, the flight itself. The next tapping point, and we, from here we work down the body, it's the top of the head, underneath the eyes, wrist on wrist. Okay, we've got to be tapping whilst tuned into the fear. But for coach Lawrence Layton, addressing the cause of each individual's aviophobia is far from straightforward. Well, fear flying is not just a fear of crashing. It's actually made up of multiple different aspects. So for some, the fear of flying is actually the fear of heights. Uh, for some people, it's the fear of enclosed spaces or claustrophobia. And for some, and a lot of them, it's the fear of being out of control. <laughs> The triggers, and there are multiple triggers, could be different in every single person. 10.30 a.m., 45 minutes until departure, and Gordon still hasn't told his wife he's here. How are you feeling this morning? I'm, I'm pretty scared. I'm, I'm not looking forward to it. Just wanting to get it over and done with. So yesterday, I felt great afterwards, right up to about 10 o'clock last night, and then, you know, the apprehension kicked back in again. For one phobic in the group, it's all proving too much. Because you've got the fear of having a panic attack. It's the fear of the fear. Right now, Daniel, what you're doing is you're trying to suppress that panic attack. You're trying to push it down. So we're just about to board the flight. We checked in a few moments ago. Uh, the tension here among these people is really, well, it's quite intense, to be honest. I think looking around their faces, it's very obvious just how much these people have had to make themselves come here. Just hope it goes well on the flight. It's their last chance to back out. Good morning, how are you? Oh, very nervous. That's fine. Well, you can sit anywhere after all five, all right? This will be the first time Gordon has flown in 10 years. And his heart rate monitor will be running throughout. 
At the moment, he's too stressed to even talk to me. Captain West explains what the plane is doing at every stage of the flight. That click is the changeover from the ground power unit to the APU, the auxiliary power unit. Remember that little jet engine in the tail? Please be aware that your nearest exit may be behind you. If we land on water, take the life jacket from under your seat. Put it over your head. So here comes the power coming on now. Speed increasing now. Noise it's the moment of truth. Take off. Wings effortlessly lifting us into the air. Give yourselves all a massive great cheer. Here we are. We're flying very well done, everybody. Fantastic. We're up. But for Gordon, it's not over yet. His heart rate is already higher than normal. But it's when the plane levels out that it seems to suddenly spike. This moment appears to be the specific trigger point for Gordon's fear. But using the relaxation techniques he was taught yesterday, he gets over it in moments. So heading northeast at the moment, breathe. and if we're doing the route, I think we'll be turning left here, otherwise we'll be like straight down south. We'll end up doing the same route as we... Gordon then does something he never thought possible. 10,000 feet above the ground, he stands up. Oh, dude, I'm so pleased with you. For Gordon, it's as effective a cure as he could ever have hoped for. Now I'm feeling fantastic. I feel absolutely fine. Already I've stood up and haven't walked far, but I've been up, seat belts off. I'm when more was relaxed. the last time that you stood up on a plane? 25 years ago. It's just it. It is really extraordinary. It's really extraordinary. I'm so, so pleased for you. Give yourselves one massive round of applause for becoming fearless flyers. Well done to everybody. That's us down. You've literally just done a flight. Yeah, yeah. You've literally just done a flight. Give yourselves another round of applause. You've done it. Well done.